Hi, everyone. We hope you've enjoyed the All In podcast thus far. We promised to keep the good times coming on our end, but wondered if you would be willing to do us a quick favor. If you've enjoyed what you've heard, please rate us or leave a review on iTunes or wherever you choose to listen to your podcast. And if you haven't already, don't forget to subscribe. Now, on with the show. Lisa O'Neill has been a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints her entire life. Her husband, Scott O'Neill, CEO of the NBA's Philadelphia 76ers, was raised Catholic. The two were married over 20 years before Scott decided to meet with the missionaries in 2016. What prepared his heart for that moment? What advice would he give to others in handling a similar situation? And how has becoming a member of the church blessed his life? We find out on this week's episode of All In. Scott O'Neill received his bachelor's degree from Villanova University and his MBA from Harvard Business School. He was previously the president of Madison Square Garden Sports and is now the CEO of the Philadelphia 76ers, the New Jersey Devils, and Harris Blitzer Sports and Entertainment. He and his wife, Lisa, are the parents of three daughters. This is All In, an LDS Living podcast where we ask the question, what does it really mean to be all in the gospel of Jesus Christ? I'm Morgan Jones, and I want to invite you to listen in on a conversation I recently had with Scott O'Neill while in Philadelphia for a video shoot. I hope you enjoy it. All right. So, Scott, first of all, when did you begin to love sports? I have always loved sports. But that's not why I love what I do. Okay. I think sports is a great escape for me now. Like when I play sports, I still play quite a bit. As much basketball as I can possibly play over the course of a week, I play. I coach my daughters. I still coach my two youngest daughters in basketball, which is my true, uh, one of my true joys in life. And I think that um, basketball, sports in general, but basketball in particular, is a great teacher. And I think it teaches you how to win and how to lose and how to sacrifice of yourself for the greater good. I think it teaches you how to compete and like fight for what you want. And, um, and I think it, it teaches you how to sweat and how to work. And, and I love the aspect of team that particular team sports brings and that you're working together kind of in concert for something greater. And, um, and that's very different from what I do in my, my day job and why I love my job. But the actual uh, sports, it's my escapism from the world. When you're coaching your girls in basketball, what's your biggest tip for them? <laughs> uh, um, well, I, I, am, I have some rules. So my first time, first game I ever coached, um, Alexa, my oldest, who's now 19 and at UVU, it's a freshman and doing great. She was five years old and, um, and I was coaching. It was my first time I've ever coached. I'm, I'm relatively intense. I'm not sure if that will come across in this video, but I have a lot of intensity to me. And so I was telling my, I told the ref before the game, and I quote, don't treat them like girls. In other words, like, let's let these girls play because I want basketball to be a teacher for them about how hard they want to work. And I think in particular, life is pretty hard for girls. I have have three girls, three daughters, and I see what happens in middle school and high school, and it's not always good and fun. And I think that support system you can get from a team is very important. So the first thing I'm always trying to drive is a love of the game. I want all the young girls and young women who play for me to play the next year. So that's my my first objective. The second thing is I want them to know that there's positive energy coming from you all the time. You'll never hear me say, you missed a shot, bad pass. It's always, you can do it, great look, and always very positive. But I do want them to play with intensity and grit. Now, this is five-year-olds, just so you remember, okay? So I said to my girls, Alexa, I said, Alexa, take the ball. So she took the ball. And it's a little little six-foot rims. Dribble down, gets a basket. Girl dribbles over. I'm like, take it. Takes the ball. Dribbles down. Gets another layup. Amber, take the ball. Amber takes the ball. Dribbles down. Gets a ball. Anna, take it from her. Takes it. So we're up 8, 10, nothing right away. And the ref is saying, back off, back off, back off. And I said, "Uh, guys, take the ball. So Alexa takes the ball again. Goes down, gets a layup. Girl's dribbling down again. He's like, back off, back off. And I said, why don't you ref and why don't you let me coach? Blew the whistle. Stop traffic. Everyone in the gym, including my lovely wife, Lisa, was giving me the glare of death. And that was the, and he said, if I hear one more word out of you, 
I will personally escort you out of the gym. And that's the last issue I've ever had. So I've never had that happen again. But that was my introduction to coaching. Since then, I've been coaching for 15 years, usually two teams, always my daughters. We do not win a lot. We have a lot of fun. The girls get to name the, the team. Uh, right now, we're the, we're the Pandas and the Tigers, two wonderful names for basketball teams. And I get to know who their friends are. And I get to know, I, get, I drive their kid, their friends to practice and back and forth to practice. And we talk about how things are going at school and what the issues are and what a mean girl is saying. And we talk about how you might deal with that. And we equate that and kind of make that transition as, well, it's all very similar to what we're playing, how we're playing today. So I, I use basketball analogously for a lot of points of my life. I love that. I don't think there's a better mascot than a panda. Right. So I would like to see a dunking panda. I think that would be interesting. Scott, I feel like you have a job that so many people would love to have. How were you able to kind of break into this industry? Well, I think I have the greatest job in the world. And I'm, I started the old-fashioned way. I mean, I was at Villanova University for undergrad as a marketing major. I went to the beach for the summer after I graduated without a job, played a lot of basketball, had a lot of fun, and started applying for jobs and was fortunate enough to be hired as a marketing assistant for the New Jersey Nets. They're the Brooklyn Nets now, but they were the New Jersey Nets at the time. And, and, a, and a somewhat of a, um, not, a, not, a not regarded as a championship-type um, organization, if you will. Um, but I, I started when I was 22. I worked... I was making $15,000 a year with no vacation, no benefits, and no overtime, which I'm sure isn't even legal these days. And I absolutely loved it. I was living in a three-bedroom apartment in Hoboken, New Jersey, the home of Frank Sinatra, with seven of us. And so we used to rotate, you know, one month, you'd have to sleep on the couch, and otherwise you'd just bunk up with one of your friends. So it was pretty slim pickings financially, but I fell in love with the business. I, I was there all the time. I was the first one in the office and the last one to leave. I was fascinated by the way sports could move crowds. And I've never looked back. I've never had more fun. It's amazing. And you met your wife how? Uh, on Mutual.com. <laughs> no, we didn't. There was no Mutual.com back not, then. There's but we not have even. Met, no, we wouldn't have met on Mutual.com. So Lisa was an intern. So she had applied. She's a big basketball fan, big jazz fan, or was. And um, she had applied for an internship with all 30 NBA teams. And she got three offers for internships. She was at Brigham Young University at the time. So she got an internship offer at the Orlando Magic. Shaq was a rookie that year. Um, Philadelphia 76ers, where we are now. That's where the Allen Iverson era. So, And then the New Jersey Nets. And she took the least desirable one, which was the New Jersey Nets, which is where I was. So um, when we talk about hand-to-God moments, that's always one that I, I always bring up because there's no way anyone in their right mind would have chosen the Nets internship over the Philadelphia 76ers or the Orlando Magic. And do you remember what your first impression of her was? Yes, I do. So she's very beautiful now, still. And I always, I always um, mention to my friends, she's like a Benjamin Button of women. She gets prettier every year. But she was, she was strikingly beautiful at 21. I was 22. And I just remember her having just kind of a special light in her eyes. And um, good positive karma and energy. I just wanted to be around her. So I let her ease into her internship. I wasn't going to, you know, I let her settle in for a good three or four days before I asked her out. And then what happened after that? Tell me about your, the progression of your relationship. Sure. Well, boy, she, you know, we, we fell in love pretty quickly. Or at least one of us did. And uh, we dated through her internship. And then she went down to... Uh, There was a national sports radio station in D.C., and so she got a summer internship in D.C., Um, so we would see each other on the weekends. And then in the fall, she went back to school, and then it was just a long distance. And then there was, the first time I saw her, I think, was, boy, I might be getting my years wrong. I think it was the NBA All-Star Game in Salt Lake City. Um, Stockton and Malone were named co-MVPs, and uh, I went out with my dad and my brother, and we spent some time with her family. It was a pretty amazing time. But I, I was in love. And then she, I was madly in love with her. And, and then she was applying for jobs. And then um, got a job with the New York Mets. And she lasted one day. 
because the commute was like two hours on three different trains. And then she started, kept applying for jobs and she ended up getting hired at the NBA, at the league office. And then, you know, she took me to my first, my first sacrament meeting. It was the Spanish speaking branch in Jersey City, New Jersey. Unfortunately, neither of us speak Spanish. So um, the fact that we went back the second week is really pretty special. So let's back up just a little bit. Do you remember when you first realized or found out that she was a member of the church? Oh, man. Um, probably pretty shortly thereafter. I mean, in those days, there was not, it wasn't very, you know, I'm 49 years old. It was, it was, it was not a very politically correct climate like you'd have today. So things like your background or where you're from or what religion is, was kind of commonly talked about in the office. So I, I was probably like the first or second day. With with Lisa, what, did you have any hesitation about dating a member of the church, or when did that first become when did that become a real issue or a thing, or was it ever? It was never. I never hesitated for a minute in dating her because she was a member of the church. I mean, I what I was attracted to about her was just her core strength and values her love and strength of her family and how beautiful she was. I was young, you know, <laughs> but she was beautiful inside and out. And so, no, no, being a member of the church was never a factor for me. Were you religious growing up? I have always had a strong faith growing up. I was raised in a Catholic family. My dad was born in Bayside, Queens, in a lower middle class neighborhood. He always tells a story about how the six um, he and his five siblings all, always stayed in the same bed. So it wasn't a, a house of many means. And the way my dad escaped from, from his lot in life was to become a Marist brother, which was an order of the uh, priests or brothers in the Catholic church. So we grew up, I went to Catholic high school, I went to Catholic college, went to church every Sunday. I was baptized and confirmed in that church. So I would say I have a very strong faith, a um, very strong testimony of Jesus Christ. But I was not engaged, I'd say, at a level in the church. In retrospect, so now looking back, and obviously a lot has happened since then, but in retrospect, why, why are you grateful that you chose Lisa? Sure. Well, choosing Lisa and Lisa choosing me are two different things. I have not, I've never thought for a second what my life would be like if Lisa and I were not together. I mean, it's been, we've been married for 23 years and um, we plan on spending eternity with her. So I'm not sure. I, I mean, I, I, can't ima- I, I can't even fathom and imagine what life would be like without her and my three daughters. And I know that, I've, I've told her this um, countless times, I, I'm allowed to do what I do because we have this partnership we call Team O'Neill. We have this partnership together. And, and she, when Alexa was born, she stopped working. So she, you know, and, and before that, previously she had uh, left two jobs previously so I could go to business school and then go take another job. So she sacrificed along the way and has given me strength and support and managed our house right, and, and kind of takes the lead in raising our girls. And so, you know, I'm really... I can't, even, I, I can't even begin to fathom what, what life might look like or where I would be or what I would be doing for a living. I'm just fortunate I am where I am. Absolutely. Before you and Lisa got married, I understand that you made a commitment to her in regard to religion. Can you tell me what that commitment was and how you were able to keep it over the 21 years even before you joined the church? Sure. So we had our own version of a prenup agreement. It wasn't written, but it was oral. And it was a negotiation. So she has such a strong bond with her family. And she grew up in, in uh, Sandy outside of Salt Lake City and um, had such a strong pull to Utah. And where I, I kept saying, like, my career, our life is likely going to be here, you know, likely based in and around New York somewhere, somehow. That's the center of the sports and entertainment world. And so that, I was saying like, that is very important to me. And what was really important to her was that our children would be raised in the LDS church. 
which I didn't have much hesitation. She had such a strong faith and conviction. Uh, there wasn't much negotiation. And then my commitment to her on over the top of that was, I will always be there. So I will go to um, the sacrament meeting. I, I, I did not commit to stay for the three hours. I know it's now two, but for the three at the time. And, and did not. I, but I, I did for a long time. I would go to a sacrament meeting and then go to another Catholic mass. Did that for probably five or six years and then stopped doing that. So it was, I don't know, it was just something I did. I, I oftentimes loved my time at the various wards. We've moved a lot. I think we've probably had been in ten, nine or ten wards. And some have been branches, small little branches. And in, in some of the branches, I was given assignments. Um, when you're not a member, they give you an assignment versus a calling. So I've had a state calling. I've had some assignments from bishops. Um, and one small branch we had in a really tough part of town, I was actually teaching. And I said to the young um, branch president, I don't think I should be teaching. He looked me in the eyes. He was 23 years old. And he said, I need help. Can you help me? You know. So, so I always felt a stronger spirit and closer connection to the ward and to the church when I was engaged and involved. I, I, many people thought I was, assumed I was a member or thought I was a member. I was pretty active at, you know, the ward Christmas party or a fall festival or a trunk or treat or whatever the, the uh, events we had. Um, so I was, I was pretty engaged. So over time, obviously, things happen. People make an impact in your life. And eventually you get to the point where you decide to move toward joining the church. But what were some of the significant points along that journey? Okay, there's so many significant points. I'll capture a few of them, but I could probably talk to you for 10 hours, unfortunately, or fortunately. I think the, the core and most influential person in my spiritual journey and eventual conversion was Lisa. Um, she always was stayed prepared. Like we had a house that was pure and faith-filled. We had family home evenings. Even, I mean, it was chaos. I don't know. I hope, I hope none of you have family home evenings like we have family home evenings, but it is chaos with these girls. Um, but we had them. We, we, the expectation was you get up and you read scriptures and you say family prayer and we pray before our meals. And on Sundays, we're going to, to church. And on Wednesday, Wednesdays, the kids are going to mutual or whatever their activity was. And, and that was, and, you know, and we were a family of faith. And so, so I think Lisa was like the core stability. Like I can't, I think like her element of just always being prepared and disciplined and passionate and consistent, I think probably had the greatest impact over the, the amount of time. I had incredible home teachers. I know we're ministering now, but I, you know, there's only the, the first person I picked up the phone to call when I decided to get baptized was my home teacher. And there's a reason for that. You know, he was, he was there and a, a big part of my life, Clark Maxwell, President Maxwell. I was part of, and the home teachers I had over the years, David Young and Peter Pilling, and Chester Elton and Clark Maxwell, and I'm probably missing a couple, were just strong, just strong, consistent reminders of the power of the gospel, the, the influence of, of having... Um, the priesthood in the home, the ability to come in and give blessings when, when we needed them. Um, so I, I think home teachers were, were particularly important. I had an experience at, at business, I went to Harvard Business School and President Iring's son, Matt. Matt Iring was a friend of mine. The school was a, had a big influence on me. Wilfred Carden, who's since passed away, uh, made a huge impact on me. Tag Romney, Greg Davis, Drew Johnson, Brian Ashton, just a couple names of people you know, in my class, in my ward, that continue this day to help me on my journey. I, I think of sometimes we talk about uh, spirituality, like there's an end point, like you got baptized. And, and for me, you know, my, my journey is just beginning. And so, and, and it's been going on for some time. So I, so I, I always look to, to kind of spiritual giants that I happen to be able to, been fortunate enough to spend time around. And I've gotten quite a bit from them. Five sick presence. So Elder Sikahema has also played a big role in my conversion in my faith journey, I was at a BYU football game and I turned around in the elevator and um, Chad Lewis was there. 
And I used to work for the Eagles when he played, number 87, played for BYU. Now he's working for the BYU Athletic Department. So I kind of turned around, and I turned around again, and I said, are you Chad Lewis? And he said, yes, I am. Nice to meet you. Who are you? I said, Scott. He said, oh, where are you from? I said, Philadelphia. He's like, you're from Philadelphia? I said, yeah, I actually worked for the Eagles when you played. He said, what do you do now? I said, I actually work at the Philadelphia 76ers. He's like, you're kidding me. So what do you do? I said, I'm the CEO. He's like, you are the CEO of the 76ers? And I said, yes, I am. Nice to meet you. Elevator opens, and we start to take off. And he says, hey, do you know Phi Sikahema? I said, I know who he is. I, I don't know him. And he said, well, let me connect you with him. Um, I think he'll, he, you'll want to know him. I said, oh, terrific. I text him from the game, and he said, hey, can we get together Tuesday at a, a diner? I said, yeah, I'd love to get together with you. So we got together at this diner, and um, he walked in, and he extended his hand, and I gave him a big hug. I said, I'm more of a hugger. And he said, well, so am I. And so we sat down. He said, look, I hate to do this to you. He said, I know I never like to start a relationship out with asking for a favor, but you know, the temple's being built here. And I said, yeah, I'm aware. And he said, well, we're having trouble for the youth celebration finding an, an arena. And we have members from Salt Lake coming out to see, to, to see places. And I don't even know where to turn. So I think this is like a hand of God that you just dropped into my lap to help me. And I said, well, I don't know. I don't know if I've been dropped in your lap, but this is one business I can actually help you with. And I said, well, when are they coming out? He said, this afternoon. I said, well, I better get to work then. And so that's how we started our relationship. And we, it's blossomed into an incredible friendship. Um, he took me through the temple open house. And um, I remember being in the celestial room and him whispering in my ear, you better get baptized. Or your daughter's going to be in here by herself on our wedding day. It had no effect on me at the time. No, I'm just kidding. So he, he's, um, he was an um, incredible force. He invited me to, to a state conference and just, we just had an unusual connection, and he's been a, been a force ever since. I love that. I love how you can see all these different people. It kind of all adds up over time, and you see God's hand. Right. There's no other. You, you can't reasonably come up with any other explanation than, than God's hand in my life and orchestrating and putting giving me chance after chance. And at some point, you know, even the most stubborn will fall. Do you think that Lisa thought you would ever join the church? I think what she will say is, I knew he was going to join the church, maybe not in this life, but definitely the next. I think that's what she'll say. But Lisa, Lisa leads by example. She's a, she's a great example. She doesn't, she doesn't, scream the loudest. She doesn't scream for attention. She's not waving her arms, look at me. She just lives like a really good, solid, faithful, faith-filled, church-based life. Like she does the right thing. She lives the right way. And I think that's how she leads. So Lisa came to Utah to get her endowments. Mm -hmm. And that's when you called Clark Maxwell about what do you do if you want to right. learn from the missionaries. Is that right? Can you tell me a little bit about sure. what happened so, there? So I've been, I've been traveling quite a bit. And there's some, um, you know, I was in Las Vegas for NBA Summer League. And then I was in New York, I think for a board meeting, and then shot down to Miami. So I was in all these kind of fun cities and got back to Philadelphia. The girls were all out west. Lisa was out there as well. And she was, she was talking about going through the temple for the first time. And I had, in fairness, I had encouraged her, you know, about a dozen times, maybe not, six, six, seven times at least, and was wondering why. I said, look, I said, I don't know how it works. I don't know what the rules are. I don't know what kind of life you have to, to live or lead, but I can't imagine anybody in the world being more ready or more prepared or living a better life than you are. So I think, I think her journey to go through the temple, um, and while maybe it took so long, was because of how important it was to her. And that's a, it's such an incredible step, having gone through it myself, and understanding the blessings and, and the power that comes with that. That comes with, I think, a lot of responsibility. And I think she understood the weight of it. And, um, and, and maybe that, you know... It's that expression, a man plan and God laugh. I think that 
you know, I don't think we could have, I don't think we could have planned this, the timing, everything seemed to fall into place at the right time and the right reasons. So it was a, it's a pretty special time. So she went out to, she went through the temple with her, her mother and father, her twin brother, his wife, Stephanie. And then, and I, I was home alone and I was just ready. I've been ready probably five or six times earlier in my life. And, and every time I was ready, something would happen. Like I would walk into a fast and testimony meeting and somebody would get up and say something. And I would say, no, thanks. Um, or, you know, I would be walking in the hallway and I would get some like snide remark or, and it probably wasn't snide. And it was, pro- it was probably, you know, I, I guess if you're pure of heart, you'd see the adversary working against you. I'd say, no, I'm just too stubborn. To, you know, I was maybe hearing what I wanted to hear or not hearing what I wanted to hear. Um, but, I, but I had been down the road before and had never mentioned anything to Lisa because, you know, everything was great. Like, my life is great. I, I love my relationship with her. Like, we, we understand each other. My family is critically important in my life. And I have such a strength and comfort for who I am and what I do and how I live. And I didn't want to just screw it up. I didn't want to, like, get her excited and then go another way. And I just didn't want, I didn't want the, the pain or drama. So I called... Um, President Maxwell, who's in our state presidency, and and he he's uh, he was our home teacher, um, and just like you know, he should be a mission president. If someone's listening out there, he should be a mission president somewhere. He he's he and his wife Carrie are uh, they're dear friends, and and he has everything that's right about a church run by lay people. Like he 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 lives it, um, he is it. He he means what he says. He says what he means. Uh, he lives the gospel every minute of every day and is a great example. And so I called him and I said, hey, um, any chance we can catch dinner? So we went to Red Sombrero. It's, a little, it's like a takeout Mexican, but we're eating outside. And, um, and I just sat down and said, all right, I'm ready to get baptized. How does this actually get done? And he said something like only you would start that way. And um, he said, well, you know, have you read the Book of Mormon? I said, yep. He said, do you have a testimony? I said, yep. And he said, well, let's, let's call the missionaries and get the discussions going. And I said, well, you know, I, I kind of need the 2.0 version. I mean, I've been coming to church for 20 years. So I love missionaries. I love, you know, 19-year-old men walking me through the plan of salvation. But I'm really looking for, like, a little next-level conversation, And which he laughed, of course. And... um he said, I said, I said, oh, one more thing. I said, I don't want like this to be the scuttlebutt. I'm sure there's, I said, I don't know how it works, but I imagine there's some role and the bishop knows, then the state president knows, then the bishop's wife knows. And then somebody calls Lisa and this whole thing goes haywire. Like, I can't have it. And um, he said, I'll take care of that. And I said, can you take care of that? He's like, yeah, well, figure it out. In a, in a um, small world, hand of God moment, twist of fate, they came over that night I think they broke their curfew. So we need to talk to that mission president as well. And we had our, the first discussion, and, and they were the, the Spanish-speaking elders. And I, I thought that was funny, having my first church experience was at a Spanish-speaking branch. And um, I kind of chuckled to myself at that. And then and President Maxwell would not let me alone with them, which I thought was really cute. Like, so uh, we met every day for a week. I, just, I said, look, let's go. You know, I'm not slowing the process down. I don't want you to slow it down. Tell me what I have to do between the first time we meet and the second time we meet, and I want to punch through. So we met, uh, I think, five days in a row. Elder McLaughlin, Elder Carter, um, wonderful, wonderful missionaries. So we, we tackled um, some of the tougher issues that you, you would want to tackle. And I think the best thing and smartest thing that President Maxwell said to me was, look, you know, like, we don't have it all figured out. You know, at the end of the day, you know, the timing might not be right. Or, you know, we, ha- we have this blessing of this living prophet. And, you know, you see what the incredible changes that President Nelson has, has driven. And he said, you have strong faith that you believe in the Book of Mormon, you believe Jesus Christ is our Savior, 
you believe you have a living prophet, you're going to have to jump over some hurdles, you know? And, and I thought that was like, it was so authentic to me and really resonated. And I was ready to go. And then um, about five days later, Lisa came home and I uh, just walked in the door with, with uh, three daughters and I gave Lisa a big hug and kissed the girls. And I said, hey, you got a minute? So we went back in our, our um, family room and just closed the door because I had like closing doors and and uh, I told her I wanted to be baptized. Yeah, we both cried and and uh, and hugged. And she's like, she kept saying, "Like, wait, what? Is this real?" And um, the girls came in. And they're like, "Why are you crying?" Anyway, so but we didn't tell them for a few days. I said, "Hey, I've got to go through one more of the discussions, and then I want to set a date, and I want to go." And um, she's like, all right, well, let, let's wait until you set a date, and then we'll let the girls know. And a couple of days later, uh, we got a chance to tell them, which was a pretty spectacular time, too. So it was a, it's, a, it's a wonderful time in my life. It is today, you know, and, and what, you know, what we've experienced over the last two, two, two and a half years is, is what some people experience over a lifetime. And so to have that all condensed has been a blessing beyond words. So it was pretty amazing. Scott, how have you seen the gospel bless your family in the past two and a half years? Hmm. Well, it's been, I think it's been, um, it's been a time of first. Like, so I had, um, I remember when I, when I told the girls I was getting baptized, they said, can we tell anybody? Like, how's it going to work? I said, ah, I'm going to send out a bunch of notes tonight. And I, and I sent out, um, there's a great bit emoji with a little missionary of the Book of Mormon. And it says, I believe on top. So I, that's all I sent. I sent it out to like 200 people that I knew. And so word spread pretty quickly. And then I followed up with our baptism day. And we had, I mean, this was, this was not a, a baptism. This was like a full-on party. So we had people from all over the country. 300 some odd people came. and So that was just the start, I guess, the start of it. And then, um, you know, next week I'm passing the sacrament. And then the week after that, I'm blessing it. Then I became a Melchizedek priesthood holder. And then I um, got my temple recommend, went to the temple. And then I got sealed to my family which was probably the best day of my life. So blessings, giving blessing, blessing my children, um, giving them blessings for the start of school or struggling when they're struggling. Or, you know, I, you know, I remember this one story. It probably doesn't matter in the scope of life, but I was at, um, I mean, young men, so I was a priesthood advisor, so I was, messing around with the priest, doing something, playing a word game, and I kept losing, and it frustrated me to no end, and the bishop came and tapped me on the shoulder and said, hey, can you give a blessing to these two women? They just walked in, and I was just like, I had never done it before. I'm like, you mean now? He's like, well, you do know how to give a blessing. I'm like, yeah, 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 no, I, I can do it. Um, and I remember just um, walking into one of those little side rooms, you know, and, and um, placing my hands on the first elderly woman's head and then the second and just like feeling a spirit like screaming through my chest you know to have that opportunity is it's pretty amazing and powerful and impactful um, I got my patriarchal blessing like so think about all the stuff you do in your entire life as a member of the church and then can you imagine compacting that into 12 months like it's unbelievable and so when you're asking me a question about you know, what are the blessings? It's almost incalculable. Like I, I um, you know, I, I think Lisa will say we have a stronger spirit or there's, you know, having the priesthood uh, leader in the home, there's more balance. And like, I, I feel like we can do it together and lead. And um, so I'm sure that that's true. She'll be more acutely aware of that than I will. Um, but for me, it's just been this whirlwind of, 
incredible, life-defining moments that uh, have changed the, I guess, course of my history. I baptized my dad who passed away. And my grandfather and my grandmother. So, so, you know, we're, we're, we're getting through it. It's, and then, you know, you know, that hours, it gives you a better appreciation when you remember just the, co- the commitment. It's, it's pretty heavy, you know, in terms of if you want to magnify your calling and you want to be all in and you want to, you know, be who you say you are and be what you're talking to the priest about being, um, you know, it's, it's a real commitment. I had been paying tithing for, I don't know, 20 some odd years. So that wasn't an adjustment. A couple of tweaks on the word of wisdom. And we were there. Um, but the, the commitment of time is, it's, it's real. It's a lot. And, um, you, it's, you certainly get more than you give. Um, but it is, that is no joke. The hours you put in. Scott, what is your calling in the church right now? Yeah, so I'm, I'm somewhat like in, a, in the gray area. So I'm a priesthood advisor. I also um, was called to state young men's secretary. And I'm serving in the um, public affairs, key opinion leader, system public relations, something with uh, Shelby Christensen, who's an incredible saint. So, yeah, so I'm, I'm in the thick of it. I think one of those might be shifting out, but I told them as a priest advisor, I'd like to have that as a lifetime calling. So I told the um, elder Coons that and then the stake president and the bishop and both shook their head and said, that's not how it works. Why do you think, Scott, why was being sealed to your family so important? And can you tell us a little bit more about that day? I'll tell you whatever I remember. It's, it's a bit of a fog. That was something I was most excited about. Um, it's hard, you know, if you grow up, I'm not sure what the correct term is, like a split member family. or what I don't know what the correct term is, but when there, you have some non-members in your family or a married couple has one member, one non-member, um, it's a little confusing for the children. Um, in particular, the, you know, the together forever part. You know, you have the songs, families can be together forever. They have that. And then they have like the temple pictures that they color when they're really little and like families are eternal. And then, you know, then they get a little older and they're actually talking about, you know, being sealed and what that means. And then they're coming home and saying like, hey, wouldn't that be awesome? And they're, you know, they're confused, frustrated or disappointed or, um, or sensitive or, you know, curious. And I think, you know, all of that traffic went to Lisa. None of that traffic ever came to me. Um, so I, I think, I think um, being baptized was this kind of momentous moment um, in our family's lives and our history. And, and then being able to be sealed was something I, I was even more excited about. And, and so were the girls. And so to, to have the opportunity to... Hmm. I wish everyone had the opportunity to be sealed to their families when they were 16 and 13 and 10. I do. Um, to, to be kneeling at an altar and have these three beautiful angels walk across the room in, in all white and, and hold hands. And, and you're around, you know, it was an SRO, as we call it in the sports business, standing room only room. And just... Uh, just this incredible reverent spirit with all these saints that we love um, and love us. And um, boy, that, that, that day, that's the greatest day of my life. Scott, what would you say to someone, a family that maybe is in the same situation that you were in for those 21 years of your marriage, maybe to a wife that is hoping that her husband will join the church or to her husband, what would your advice to that family be? I think my advice to families 
where one is a member and, and one is not yet, um, first I would say you should talk to Lisa because she'd be much better at this than I will. But secondly, I think just from my experience, I would say if, if you're the member, I would just say um, be faithful and, and build your testimony and magnify your calling and serve others and, and love others. And be true. Be true to who you are and, and what Heavenly Father expects of you. Live that. Um, and also, love your spouse a lot. And if that spouse needs room, give him or her room. And if that spouse needs to be nudged, give him or her a nudge. Um, but don't quit. You know, it's a, eternity is a pretty long time. You want to make sure that, that you are prepared and you're living a good example and you are giving um, the person you love uh, every opportunity to see the blessings and joy that the gospel brings you in your life. I think that's the best way to bring them along. I have a friend that always says, life is long. And when she says it, she it's so f- interesting because it's so opposite of like life is short. Mm-hmm. And she's like, life is long. Like give things time to work themselves out. Believe that things, good things will happen. And it's become one of my favorite sayings, too. Mm, I love that. Scott, when you look back on your life, do you feel like you joined the church at the right time? You know, when I joined the church, two of my friends told me, you're coming in at the perfect time. And I I didn't understand what they meant or why. I know that I have a job in my secular life that can bring attention and positive attention to the church. And, and I know that the responsibility on me is to live the right way and be an example. I remember my um, Lisa's grandmother was getting old, um, and she had lost her step a bit. And so, like many older people come for Sunday dinners, what happens is they end up sitting in a chair, and then nobody talks to them. And so Graham, as we called her, was sitting in her chair, and she had like, a cool hat on. And, um, and Lisa was nudging me, go talk to Graham. And I was like, why do I have to talk to Graham? She's like, go talk to Graham. I said, okay. And so I rolled over to Graham. I pulled up a chair and I said, I held her hands. I said, how are you doing, Graham? And so we were talking a little bit. And she said, you are going to be an incredible member of this church. I said, oh, Graham, I'm not a member of this church. She said, you are going to be an incredible member of this church. I said, oh, thanks, Graham. She said, you are going to bring thousands of people into this church. I said, Graham, I'm Scott. I'm Lisa's husband. She said, and she looked me in the eyes, and she says, you need to lead, you know? And um, I was thought about that. I was probably, I don't know, I was probably 15 years ago, maybe more. She's since passed away, sadly. And I remember walking over to Lisa, and she said, what were you and Graham talking about? I said, ah, nothing. <laughs> and I always think about that as, as, a, as a responsibility. You know, I, I, think, I think about those that, um, pioneers that went west. And I say to all of the members in Utah that are watching this right now, it's time to come east. Well, there's a lot happening out here, you know. Um, and this church is too small. You know, we've got 16 million members. We've got 7.5 billion people on this planet. And we need to do more. And we need to be less insular. And we need to be more loving. We need to be more open. We need to be more assertive. We need to leverage social media. We need to leverage the people we know, the influence we have. And we need to do a better job because this gospel is too special. We need to do a better job sharing it. Scott, as you've been talking, I couldn't help but think about on my mission, we made this video and we asked people to share how they felt about the person that introduced them to the gospel. And so for you, how do you feel about Lisa and specifically Lisa introducing you to the gospel of Jesus Christ? How do I feel about Lisa? I mean, it's... So, I don't know if I can put this into words. I'm going to give it a whirl. So, Lisa is, um, 
I'm more in love with her today than I was yesterday, and the day before that, and the day before that, and the day before that. And I'll be more in love with her tomorrow, and the day after that, and the day after that. She's world-class mom, incredible wife, saint of saints. She's got like the purest heart um, to help and serve others. And she's such an example of humility. And, and I think, yeah, I can't imagine, a, you know, I'm sure there are more wonderful people out there. I just haven't met them yet. I think she's as good as they come in every facet. She's tough. She's smart. She's beautiful. She challenges me to be better and better man. Um, she's raising incredible girls. And she's helping drive drive the gospel, you know, in her own way, in a different way. She does it through service and love and, and helping others. But I don't, I don't think there's anybody like her in the world. Scott, I just have two last questions Let's for you. Let's do it. One, what, what would you say as far as how you balance being a husband, a father, a member of the church, and an NBA CEO? So how do I balance it all? It's a big question. Big, big question I, I get quite a bit. Um, I, I think the question, I don't think the question is the right question because I don't think balance is something that is attainable and I don't strive for it. So I, what I strive to do is I strive to make sure that I know what my priorities are, and my priorities are my family, my faith, and my work. And so to the extent I'm spending time on my family, my faith, and my work, um, that's a good start. To the extent that when I'm spending time with my family or with my faith or both or on my work, that I'm wholly present and I am, as I like to say, I am where my feet are, I think... Um, I can be better at what I do with the time I have. Uh, we don't have a lot of time. You know, as a dad, I don't have a lot of time. I get up in the morning, it's chaos in the morning in my house. People getting ready, breakfast flying all over the place, scrambling for the car, books, and book bags, and sneakers, and blah, blah, blah. And so I've got, what, 40 minutes in the morning? I drive Kira to seminary and pick her up. I got my 40 minutes there, and then I got 40 minutes of chaos in the house. And I'll be home tonight at 8 o'clock. And hopefully I'll get an hour with them. And so I've got to spend those two hours. I've got to make sure that I am 100% with them. My phone's down, the TV's off, and I'm connecting with them on something that matters and something that's real. Um, and that I can help them and maybe teach them or maybe learn from them. And then when I'm at work, I'm not worried about what my daughter's doing at school because I'm focusing on here. Um, when I'm talking to you, I'm talking right at you. I'm not focusing on what I'm doing in five minutes or 10 minutes or what I did five minutes ago. Uh, so, so for me, it's about being where my feet are. And that, that's the best way I can live my purest life. That is ironic, or maybe not ironic at all, but I think it's super interesting. A few weeks ago, I interviewed Greg McEwen. I don't know if you've ever read Essentialism, mm -hmm. but he's a member of the church. And when I asked him I the all-in question, yeah. he said that he had been um, reading President Nelson's book or, you know, he had watched a documentary about President Nelson, mm -hmm. and in it, his kids said that he was 100% present wherever he was. Oh, so when he was good. at the that's hospital, he was present. When he was with his family, he was present. And Greg said that he thought that's what it meant to be all in. And so you are following the example of the prophet, which is pretty cool. Um, last question for you, Scott. What does it mean to you to be all in the gospel of Jesus Christ? Uh, to be all in the gospel of Jesus Christ, it means that, that I keep the commandments, that I magnify my calling, that I read my scriptures, that I get on my knees and pray, that I serve and help those that need to be served and helped, that I love people even when they're not ready to love themselves, and that I try to live a life that would make the Savior proud if you were standing right next to me. Thank you. 
Thank you to Scott O'Neill for being willing to share his testimony and story with us. Be sure to keep an eye out for the LDS Living videos featuring Scott and his wife, Lisa, that will be released soon. If you don't want to miss them, subscribe to the LDS Living YouTube channel or follow us on Facebook. You can find the show notes and more episodes of All In by visiting ldsliving.com slash all in. Thank you so much.